friends. Welcome back to the Wall Street Skinny. I'm Jen. I'm Kristen. And we are two lifelong friends with a combined 25 years of experience working and teaching on Wall Street here to give you the skinny on the world's most elite, highest paying jobs and to answer all the questions you've always had about high finance, but were too afraid to ask. As we've grown our community over the past year, we've had two overwhelming requests, one for an explainer on real estate and another for us to bring on more guests who are senior women in finance who are also mothers to share their perspective. Well, today we're going to tackle both. So we are bringing on Deborah Smith, who is the CEO and co-founder of Center Cap Group, which is a boutique investment bank that is focused entirely on real estate advisory. So we're going to explain how the commercial real estate market actually works. We're going to explain what real estate investment banking even is. And Deborah's going to share her incredibly inspiring story about how she went from a dairy farm in Australia to founding her own investment bank, all with three kids under the age of five, no less. So, oh, by the way, and speaking of little kids, okay, before we get into it, I've been watching The Valley. And yes. so for those of you who don't know what this is, they took the cast-offs from the early seasons of Vanderpump Rules and like found them where they all are now with little kids. Kristen, have you been watching it? I really, I've been wanting yes. to talk to you about this. So it's How I far actually, in are you? I've only John, got episode like one and a half under my belt. Oh, I'm, I'm through it. So, well, oh, it's I mean, already I'm, over? I'm caught up. Yeah, I'm caught up. <laughs> but John wanted to watch it. Again, my husband like loves that. He's going to kill me for this, but like he, he loves, loves to watch these like trash We're not editing this shows. out. Yeah, no, we're not. And he kept saying, he's like, so do you want to watch The Valley? Do you want to watch The Valley? And I was like, Ugh. you know, I just, it's it's always, we've talked with this, right? Like the, it's a heavy lift to get me into a new show. Even if yeah. it's a show that I like, that I'm like super into in the past, it's always mm -hmm. a heavy lift to get me started again. And then yeah. you shared this one clip on social media <laughs> with the this guy and he's like, yeah, you know, you might recognize me. I was an actor back in like Hannah Montana and all these things. He's like, or you might recognize me from The Walking Dead. He's like, Wah! and it's <laughs> he's the most doing wild. zombie noises. How would you recognize an actor from his zombie noises? I mean, and that after that, had me, I was, I was sobbing with yeah. laughter. So, well, so when you shared that, I was like, okay, now I really need to watch this. So we started <laughs> and, um, I mean, it's, it's got, so for anyone who is a Vanderpump person, like the early cast, it was Jax, it's got Kristen, it has Jax's wife, Brittany, who I guess they've now separated and actually another <gasps> what? duo in the mix separate. You didn't? Where have you been? Yes. I don't know. Yes. Oh, I didn't know they this. Separated. That was why oh when, my God, when I made a going to color my well, whole view of the. Oh yeah. no, maybe you well, did tell was, me this. Well, yeah, because he was on Watch What, or they were on Watch What Happens Live, or it was like they, they had one of the Bravo people on, and they were like, "Yeah, one of the bad things that Jax did is someone made a comment like, oh, you should have married Stassi,' and he liked it. It's like, oh, they were. Oh, awful I together. remember you told mm -hmm. me that, but I didn't know yeah, that separated. they were also separated in that context. Yeah. I mean, that would mm -hmm. be reason enough for them to probably get separated if they weren't well, already, but <laughs> no. They this <laughs> is after they were separated. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's entertaining. Like I that mean, marriage lasted way longer than I anticipated. Than anybody so anybody anticipated. To them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't yeah. believe they even made it down the aisle. But one <laughs> of the things that's funny about that show is they took all of the people who made a name for themselves in whatever D E F G list reality TV by like going out and partying. And they're like, let's see what they do now. Now that they have kids. And it's them doing the exact same things and going out and partying. And there's just like a sad child, like, like unsupervised or like with a nanny well, in the corner. And it makes me so sad. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, they, they all, it's crazy. They all do have kids. And then there's like one person who just like gave birth six weeks ago to twins. That is like, oh, actually the, the walking dead person's <laughs> wife who was like Miss USA. The zombie's like wife. Gorgeous. Yeah, she's like absolutely dropped it beautiful, but she gave birth six weeks ago and it's like now on this show and it's, I don't, I mean, people are crazy. For those of you who've been following the Wall Street Skinny Gossip, we actually did audition for a reality TV show. <laughs> we've never said that. we've never said this because I think oh, we, we haven't like, said is this, this to be, publicly. Yeah, no, this is this is brand new information. Yeah, dun 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 dun, big reveal. <laughs> we we got to like third rounds of auditioning for a reality TV show, and it like honestly the commitment of we would have had to be away from our family for two to four weeks. We'd have to be away from our business. It was it was not the best timing, but it's funny because Kristen was very opposed to it at the beginning, and I was like. <laughs> try anything or whatever. No. And then by the end, they were like, send us pictures of your family. I was like, nope, this is a bridge too far. And Christian was like, I don't 
already sent it. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, I thought you were because we were like, we're just going to go through with it. Like, there's no chance it's actually going to ever happen. They were um, so nice. They were so nice. Um, oh. Okay, so reality TV aside, though, our conversation with Deborah, I actually think, was one of the most inspiring conversations we've ever had. Chris, did you feel did you felt the same way? Yeah, well, I, we were basically like, you are a spirit animal. Like, I oh want to channel you and bottle you up. She's so cool. She's a spitfire. I'm really excited. Let's bring her on. We are joined here by Deborah Smith, the CEO and co-founder of Center Cap Group. And Deborah, usually we open up these episodes by having you share your bio with us, and we're going to get to your entire incredible story. But before we do that, I would love it if you could please just talk us through what actually real estate banking is. Because yeah. everyone kind of thinks they know what real estate is, right? It's like, oh, mm-hmm. I've watched House Hunters and Million Dollar Listing. I know what real estate is. This yes. is not what real no. estate banking <laughs> is. And we've talked about a lot of other verticals. How would you explain what real estate banking is? What kind of advice are you giving and what kind of deals are you working on? Sure. And it's great to be on. Thank you both for having me on today. So you have your assets, which is our asset level, which is your commercial real estate versus residential. Commercial just is, it's used for business versus Mm -hmm. residential, you live in it, right? So Mm -hmm. it's your home. And so that's at an asset level. And a lot of the work that banks do is not really at that asset level. It's really Mm -hmm. a step above. What they're doing is you're dealing with the managers of real estate. And Mm -hmm. so for example, your top 10 managers of real estate in the world probably control one and a half to two trillion dollars of real estate very right? cool i did not know yeah, that stat. the top 20 is probably two and a half to maybe it's three trillion of real estate and, and who are these going. managers what's these an example managers, of a household name that someone might have heard blackstone blackstone yeah. is the largest global followed by brookfield and so mm-hmm. what what happens is is if you went to a morgan stanley or if you came to our firm it's a question of which type of those managers you're dealing with. And, and I'll get to some, of, at least for the straightforward banking piece. Mm-hmm. And so you're working with those kinds of parties to figure out how to grow their businesses, where they're acquiring, where they're doing a take private of, of a public REIT, where they're acquiring a private organization, another fund manager, or a huge portfolio of assets. But mm-hmm. that's usually what we're talking about if you're in the real estate banking space or mm-hmm it's dealing with rates, but it's usually uh, the controllers of capital. It's right, mm-hmm. they're the, the people who control the dollars. And so whether it's a REIT or whether it's private or whether it's public or non-traded, et cetera, et cetera, or an investment manager, it's usually the controllers of the capital that acquire and control the real estate. They're the bigger firms. And that's usually what the big banks deal with. Us, mm-hmm. we tend to go a little bit down. And so we'll be in the middle market. So a lot of the managers we work with could be 2 billion to 15 billion they control of real estate. And then we're mm-hmm. helping them figure out how to deploy it, how to raise it and how to grow their business. That's the, the basics of, of how it works. Uh, that where, where it fits in here as well is where some of the banks, the bigger banks do it. It's almost like a placement business. Um, it mm-hmm. could be under a sales part. It could be private capital, capital formation. But a lot of the bigger firms like an Evercore or Morgan Stanley, some of these firms have a sleeve that raises capital, right? Mm-hmm. And so for those managers, we're still with the people who control it. If they want to go out and say, I want to raise a fund that acquires data centers, they mm-hmm. will hire these types of folks to help them raise the capital. Mm-hmm. And so that's called a private placement business. And yeah. so some of the banks will move into that business. And then the last piece, which we do and our other firms do not, is we have a consulting business that figures mm. out how to work with managers, even moving into owners and operators of real estate, how to help them grow their business. And it's more of a consulting type function, reminiscent of a baby McKinsey type. Yeah. Concept, <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're talking about a consulting business. So yeah. that's it. Now, that's the most generalist. You can have then the users of capital. So the users of capital are your developers. We put services businesses into that. It could be engineering services, leasing, brokerage. There's a real estate services entire industry that does Mm -hmm. that. And then you can have what we call operators um, Mm -hmm. or owners of real estate. And they're the folks that are actually going out and sourcing or building the properties. If you're going to go out and build a piece of real estate, a lot of times those owners and the providers of capital, they're not doing that. They'll partner with someone to do that. The actual bulk of the world is actually smaller entrepreneurs 
that are going out and say, well, I'm going to get into self storage and they go source some high net worth capital and they go uh -huh. raise that and they buy that building. But if you think about it, us, the Morgan Stanley's and the banks, it's hard for us to work with them simply because of the economics. The deals are yeah. small, the fees are small. And so mm -hmm. you can have, you know, a, but the work is still the same. Them. It's, it's yeah. still the yeah. same amount of work, if not yeah. more. And, and you guys know this coming from banking. It's very hard for bigger banks to come into the middle market and make the economics work. We operate in the middle market. And I think we have a pretty good stake within that across all of our service offerings. And mm -hmm. over time we go up but we don't always go down simply because mm -hmm. the economics don't work. It seems straightforward, but there's so no, many pieces. No, it doesn't. A yeah. lot of different yeah. arms. Two follow-up questions yeah. because you mentioned REITs and actually mm -hmm. we haven't really talked about that at all. What exactly is a REIT? Yes. Yeah, so a REIT is a real estate investment trust. And if you're at a big bank like a Morgan Stanley, a lot of their coverage universe is on the public REITs. Mm -hmm. And so there's an entire universe of public companies that function and again, they own real estate. And in my mm -hmm. list that I said at the start around those top 10 managers, that didn't include any REITs. Mm -hmm. So the REITs is a separate owner of real estate. And in some ways they're like a manager because they raise capital from individuals, institutions mm -hmm. in the public markets. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, a Blackstone is raising it from pensions, foundations, sovereign wealth, the different investor bases, but your public mm -hmm. REIT exists to distribute cash flow, 9% of the cash flow off of their properties, right? Yeah. And so that's why they're an alternative in many ways to a, an instrument like a bond where you can yeah. get a higher return, but it's supposed to be a cash flowing asset. A lot of the reason the bigger banks focus on those public markets and those bigger companies is because real estate is it's a debt driven mm -hmm. space, right? Yeah. And we don't have a balance sheet. So we only get business on the basis of our advice and we're pretty darn good at it. So that's mm -hmm. how we're winning business. Whereas a bigger bank has a balance sheet and they have mm -hmm. an equity sales desk so they can do offerings into the public markets and they can provide debt to them. And if you mm -hmm. think about it, a lot of property, and, and this is a generalization, but a, a lot of like value add type properties are 65% leverage. So they're only yeah. using 35% of, of their own money in order to pay for it or to do improvements to it. And so mm -hmm. that's why, you know, it's very leverage driven and why there's challenges right now in the industry. Because when interest rates go up, your leverage of that 65% has gone mm -hmm. up, right? Yeah. And so it, that, that's why it causes a, a problem and why in the GFC, when there was no credit, why the transaction market? And again, today, why it's, it's tight. You've used the term value add twice now and the term yeah. opportunistic once. In our pre-call, you gave yeah. us the best explanation of the different categories of real estate investors that I've ever heard. I would love it if you could walk through those different categories and explain how they play into the overall marketplace. Yeah, sure. And this will transpire all the way up into the investment management buy side model and our client base is that you tend to classify real estate rightly or wrongly across a risk spectrum. And mm -hmm. so you have core real estate, which is supposed to be cash generating, which is a lot of the, the REIT model, it's cash mm -hmm. generating. And so your return or your dividend, Kristen, comes from the cash <laughs> that the property throws off, right? Mm -hmm. The next bucket comes up is your value add. And that's where there is an assumption you're going to do something to make this property more valuable. And so your return for the property, if you're owning it, comes in part from cash and in part from capital appreciation because you're mm -hmm. adding value. So you hope if you put in new kitchens or new landscaping, it's going to be worth more. And so your mm -hmm. bet is that you're going to add greater value than what your capital improvements and you can sell it at a greater value. That's called value add. The last mm -hmm. bucket is opportunistic. This is the higher octane stuff in our space. And that's usually new construction because mm -hmm. it's risky. Uh, you're doing land plays, that's really risky. Things that you're doing on speculation where you don't understand your tenant or you don't understand your base, anything like that moves in that higher octane. And it's, mm -hmm. it's usually not cash flowing. You're assuming that you can do something with a piece of dirt, for example, and yep. turn it into a property and your return is gonna come because you've created something out of nothing. That's mm -hmm. very simplistically how those buckets work. And as a result, both investors and managers craft their strategies around allocations to each one of those things. And so if you look at a Blackstone or if you look at an Invesco, you can look at what their return. And if I was interviewing, 
I'd be asking, well, you know, what kind of vehicles do you have and where are you on the risk spectrum and how you look at the type of properties that fit within it? Because each one of these companies will have an investment criteria for the funds mm -hmm. that they're raising and will have criteria around product, geography and risk and reward profile. Wow. And speaking about geography, as a residential real estate agent here, yeah. <laughs> obviously everyone knows the good old adage, location, location, location. And we had a conversation with a commodities trader yesterday, and we talked about how idiosyncratic that market is and how you have to understand geopolitical elements. You have to mm -hmm. understand weather. You have to understand all of these, the nitty gritty of the temperaments of the shipping operators and the guy at the port who's taking your documents. But I think real estate just as much, if not way more so, yeah. is such a hyper local specialized market. How do you get up the curve and become an expert um, from a relative value standpoint, from a, a location standpoint, from an opportunity standpoint in all of these different markets? Yeah, it's, it's the constant debate, uh, recognizing that I agree, it's a local market business and recognizing that, you know, how do you get to be local market the bigger you are as a manager? It's not like you can have mm -hmm. people in every market. And so a lot of times you'll find that in that investment strategy, we we're talking about on the funds, that it will mm -hmm. say the markets they're investing. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you'll see a Texas company just focus on Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can have a local market. All they'll say where they're smile states, all they'll say they're coastal. <laughs> and so Ooh, can you tell people what the smile states are? Because I have never heard states. that until you mentioned it. Yeah, it's the California through Texas up to Florida and up the side. So it's a big smile on your face. Mm -hmm. It's all in the smile states. <laughs> Yeah, or the Northeast. I mean, there's different strategies around geographies and mm -hmm. folks that are going to do it on a broader national scale. Then it comes down to the balance of how many people you have on the ground, when to use partners, when not to, and how mm -hmm. much you want to do in house. And I think mm -hmm. it's a struggle they all face. But I think what we all recognize is you, you have to know what's going on in a market or you run the risk yeah. of losing your shirt. Like you mm. may not know about the new local highway that's coming through or the local market sentiment from the schools that don't want something in that neighborhood. You really do need to get access. And that's part of the reason people hire partners is they mm -hmm. will go to a market, particularly if it's like something like development and because you need approvals in order to do it. It's you, you partner with someone in that market and that's their expertise. And it's the mm -hmm. same go for property management across the various sectors is a uh -huh. lot of times people will make the argument that they'll say, well, look, we pick the best in class in each local market. And I think mm -hmm. that resonates. There's a lot of logic to that. But what happens is, is you end up with a certain size usually you get to, and you think it is just more effective and efficient for me to hire all those bodies and put them mm -hmm. in those markets myself. So yeah. it really is a balance. The numbers change depending on what you're doing, where you're doing it, and how much volume mm -hmm. you're doing it in. Got it. Okay. I actually think this is a great point to pause. And Deborah, can you share with us your story of how you got into the industry in the first place, what your background was, and then how did you get to where you are today as the CEO of an investment bank? I actually grew up in Australia. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm, a uh, very, very simple, 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 humble background. And most of my career has actually been fortuitous. It's a little bit of being in the right place at the right time. Actually, it's a mm -hmm. lot of being in the right place at the really, really right time. Uh, so I went to, I, I ended up going to college at the University of Sydney and I did a double degree in economics and in law. And I didn't really know anything about banking. I wanted to be a tax lawyer. That's really what I wanted to do. And I applied to all these tax firms and I applied to Morgan Stanley and was told it's impossible to get into. So I put in an application and I got in. The other person that came in with me was an accounting major and I was a law major and I didn't know anything about finance, but I, I did okay in my, my double degree. So I guess that's something. And then I started in Australia and then they shipped me to the US as a loaner that I was supposed to be here for a year uh, in the New York office. And I hadn't actually been overseas before. And it was a wonderful experience. I loved GPUG. I, I loved being in that group. It was obviously very male dominated, but it was a wonderful experience. And they were wonderful people and wonderful mentors. I cannot say enough amazing things about that group and about that team. I, through, to this day, yeah. I still yeah. say the exact as, same thing. As an outsider, it was funny because when I was there, the three groups that had the best 
culture. It was like a known thing. It was GPUG. That was number one. And then it was financial sponsors where I ultimately went and the transportation group. Like those were the three that it just was known. Like this culture is the the place you want to be if you want to not be miserable (laughs) in investment banking. Yeah. And it it was a great experience. I mean, we had a very small group and the analysts in my group where we were really good friends. We Mm. really supported each other. It was miserable at times because it was going into the tech boom. And so we Mm. we were working crazy hours, which I don't know how many people work hours like that anymore, but there'd be days where we didn't leave. Uh, (laughs) But you know what? It's partly driven by us. We were all deal junkies and Mm -hmm. no one could say no to a deal. A deal would come in and we all wanted to do it. Uh, Even though we're all overstaffed and that's the way it it rolled. But I think it was just the chemistry amongst the team all the way up. It went all the way Mm -hmm, up to the top mm -hmm. in that group. So I end up staying, they asked me to stay for a third year. And then I was internally promoted through their ACP program into straight into associate. So I didn't go to business Mm -hmm. school. Yay. What does ACP stand for? Accelerated career path. It's Got yeah, it. it's like a Morgan Stanley specific. I I I mean, I assume they have similar names yeah. for this at other banks, but at Morgan Stanley, it was called ACP. It's become yeah. a lot easier, but I feel like back in the day, it was much much harder yeah. to get promoted directly than it has started to become. Yeah, I mean, normally what happens is you do two years and then you have to be asked for a third. And then if you say Mm -hmm. a third, there's an expectation back then that you were going to go to business school. Exactly. Um, That was the expectation. Mm -hmm. And I had no intentions of going to business school. I'd already been to Uh school for six years. I was not going back to school. And so I, I got promoted through, which was awesome. I did a lot of different industries. I worked on a lot of different things. And I actually came into an opportunity to work with my partner now, Lisa Beeson who was a managing director up in the M&A group. And then Mm -hmm. she ended up moving over to Wachovia. And uh, I ended up moving over to Wachovia on the basis that I just want to try something new. I didn't want to Mm -hmm. stay in energy and and utilities. I didn't want to be pigeonholed, which is kind of funny, given I've been in real estate for 18 years. But (laughs) at the time, at the time, I would tell my younger self, specialize, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do healthcare. And so Mm. I was like, well, I'm going to go over and work on healthcare deals. That's what I'm going to do. But for anyone who knows anything about real estate, 2005 was going to the (laughs) next boom for real estate. And so I lasted a New York minute doing healthcare and was put on my first deal doing Gables, which was a go private at the time. And uh, the rest is history. I stayed in real estate ever since. I went from there over to Lehman to work on there in real estate as well with Lisa, who also went over to to Lehman. I left right after the Archstone Smith deal was announced, which is the last thing that I was involved in, (laughs) which was hard, you know, because Lisa and I had been together for a a long time. And then I went over to run CBRE's global M&A business Mm -hmm. as a mid thirties, late 30 year old, um, which was an extraordinary opportunity for me to do. And it was a lot of fun. I was on their global leadership team it was an opportunity to be on the buy side where you're investing for your own account versus that we call it the sell side where you're the advisor. And those two fields are very, very different, uh, even though they, they work together. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to do it. And then, of course, the market crapped out. <laughs> and and <laughs> it's interesting enough, I, I feel like this is the timing, is that we closed on uh, the acquisition of a minority interest in Wood Partners, which was a big deal at the time because it was a mm-hmm. developer. And we created some really cool structuring around that for GPLP structure, which wasn't uh, well known at the time. And I feel like we closed that deal and I went home to see my family in Australia and I come back and Bear Stearns and Lehman were going under. <laughs> that's, that's literally yeah. how I felt. I went on vacation and the world crapped out. Um, <laughs> and so it's, and, and it was crazy because CB had also raised the largest value add fund that year. They'd also raised an opportunistic fund that year. And so while we had all of these funds around the world that were all struggling with challenges because of the GFC, on the one hand, we were trying to figure out how we were going to resolve issues at the properties that we owned. And in the afternoons, I felt like we were trying to figure out how to put our capital that made sense for the funds. And so Mm -hmm. it was totally a tale of two worlds um, and a massing juggling act because we were the only independent group. And so we sat apart from the investment teams. And so Mm -hmm. we were tasked with what was going on and looking at the funds from an objective standpoint, trying to find capital uh, for deals and deal with restructuring some of these things because we weren't connected to the Mm -hmm. assets. 
And mm -hmm. so I feel like everything that was not someone else's problem, that wasn't their <laughs> problem, it became an us problem. It became your problem. <laughs> it's I like, do, 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 do. yeah, now it's a you problem. Um, and so it was really, it was a really challenging time. And at the mm -hmm. time, you know, I had, I think I had at least, what I have, three kids in tow. So, you know, three young children at the time. It Wait, was, you had three young kids at the time? Yeah. Dur yeah. Oh, during wow. around that period. Yeah. We had three kids, um, three under five. And uh, <laughs> so it was, it was a crazy time that you'd go to mm -hmm. work and I deal with these problems and then I'd come home and play Zingo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. To which I, I will tell you, there's only so many games of Zingo I really can play. But I mean, oh, the kids same. Grew up on it. Those Zingo tiles are just lodged <laughs> in our air conditioning vents all over the house, <laughs> and that's about all they do. It's good for us. Can you give us some more insight into what it's like running a boutique <laughs> bank? Because yes. that is such a cool thing. And you talk about obviously the difference of having balance sheet versus not having balance sheet but what else is different how how yeah. what is this internal structure like that's so different yeah um myself from 10 years ago i will answer that different than myself today <laughs> oh interesting uh, this the self of 10 years ago who was still uh thinking it was a great idea as a women-owned firm to start <laughs> an investment mm -hmm. bank in the middle of the gfc with three kids <gasps> in tow um mm -hmm. is probably is going to give you a different answer than the, the person yeah. today um, but, but I think, you know, uh, when we started, we were very focused on the here and the now and what we were doing. It's mm -hmm. like an opportunity came in, uh, can we execute this or can we not? And we knew so many people coming from out of our CV days and coming out of banking that we knew we were unique in, in our experience because folks that have both buy side and sell side experience is not that common. We had both. We, we were raised on the sell side, but were taught older in life to think about whether it's a deal you should do. And, mm -hmm. and that's a lesson that we learned at CB is not every deal is a good deal. In fact, a lot of deals mm -hmm. are not good deals. And that's stayed with us as we have built the firm. So everything that we take on is, would I do this deal myself? Do I like mm -hmm. this deal? And do I believe I can get it done? And that means we say no to a lot of pieces of business and we're up front. I can't help you. This is not something yeah. I think I can get done. And that's our guiding path on pretty much everything. A, a lot of it now is yes, it's client selection. The biggest thing is business selection and it's building out where I think the business needs to go. And so there's a lot more management in it today um, than it used to be. We have a lot more people organizing the people, organizing our coverage strategy, organizing where we want to go, where we want to take it, and then the clients that we take on. It's a lot more strategy uh, than it's ever been. So I'm, I get up every day thinking, well, what, how are we going to continue to grow the business today? What do I need to get done around that in order to execute it? And then there's a lot more phone calls. <laughs> a lot of phone calls. I'm on the phone a lot. I still uh, yeah. actually got to tell you, I'm on the phone a lot. I, I still, email's great. But I still think that this is, it's a relationship business. As someone told yeah. me from a very, very big pension fund the other day, Deb, 75% of this business is relationships. So mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's pretty, wow, that's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but, I but love that's the true. I'm terrible over emails. I'm not one yeah. who's always you like are not agonizing over which exclamation point no. or which period Jen is sounded a machine. aggressive or too Hard disagree. Hard disagree. Jen is a machine and she writes emails that are like, actually really great in like five <laughs> seconds. I'm the opposite. I'm there sitting agonizing. Jen is, but she's also great on the phone. Um, I, I also <laughs> agonize after the fact though. I have that like, oh God, I just fired off that email to the CEO of God knows what. And I was way too, too casual. But Kristen, you had a great question yeah. that I know you wanted to ask here. Yeah. I was actually curious, like what did you need to start your own investment bank? I mean, we actually, someone had asked us one time, they were like, would you ever start your own investment bank? We were like, no, because no. we had no idea how we would do it. And also like, no, but no, what did you actually need? I feel like you must need to be obviously entrepreneurial, but what gave you the confidence to be like, we're going out and venturing on our own and starting our own boutique investment bank? Yeah. So I think for us, I just didn't think about whether it was a good or bad idea. It was just, <laughs> this is what we're doing. And it's, I yeah. actually think it's advice for any entrepreneur. It's, mm -hmm. I don't spend a whole lot of time second guessing decisions. Actually, I don't spend any time doing it. And I spend mm -hmm. even, even less time thinking about whether I'm capable of doing it. It's more a question of this is what we're going to do. So what do I need to do in order to get it? And so when we started up, 
there was an inbound into us that said, Hey, I think somebody needs some help. So why don't you guys yeah. get off the beach and figure out if this, <laughs> you can help these guys. And yeah, it was yeah. a little bit, it was a little bit like that. And that relationship is still our relationship to this day. But it was that time and then you're like, well, hang on a second. I am an attorney after all. So I'm like, well, hang on a second. We can't receive money without a bank account. I'm not taking this personally. So then we're like, well, now we need a company name. What do we call this thing? So then, and then the next thing, you know, we have a bank account, we have a name. And then it's like, well, hang on, maybe we need office space. And so a, a good friend of ours in the real estate space owned a big fund manager says, why don't you guys take some of our space? I'll even put your If only on you knew someone in real estate. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, exactly. That's exactly how it went down. So we moved in and they gave us a printer for 50 bucks. And then the next thing, you know, we're like, well, hang on a second. I think we need some people. And, yeah. and one thing leads to another and leads to another. Yeah. And then you wake up one day and then we have a bigger office. We have more people. And it yeah. kind of snowballed after that. And then, you know, like, for example, I maybe seven, eight years ago, I realized we had a really big presence with insurance companies. And so yeah. I wake up a few years later realizing that and saying, well, you mm-hmm. know what, maybe we should have an insurance coverage practice since we seem mm-hmm. to be pretty good at it. Um, but it's things like that. It's following the breadcrumbs and yep. taking yeah. advantage of opportunity when it presents. And it may be, you know, as I was talking with one of the big brokerage companies a couple of days ago, and he said to me, you know, I wasn't thinking about this opportunity, Deb, that it'd be right for us right now. I said, yeah, but you're also very good at taking advantage of opportunity when it knocks. And I mm-hmm. said, sometimes you've got to zig when you thought you were going to zag. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's what's kept us growing. And that's what's got us to where we are today. It's just yeah. recognizing, seeing the opportunity, making judgment calls on what works and doesn't work and how we're going to make the best of the opportunities we have. But at no point do I spend a lot of time thinking, well, I don't know about that. That was, you know, yeah. if I'm not going to do it, I'm not doing it and I'm done yeah. and I'm not talking about it anymore. <laughs> it's like, well, I, I think this line of questioning is like, let's move on people. <laughs> yep. I think those are words to live by. I think so many people spend endless amounts of time agonizing over whether or not they're going to make the right decision. And they would have accomplished so much more if they'd made the decision. And if it was a mistake, then you course correct. You figured but it out. I, I, I absolutely out. agree. Okay, I've got to choose your own adventure. We've got two yeah. lines of questioning yeah. that are equally important, both of which I want to explore in whole. You just talked about having the confidence to make those decisions, how you went about it. But we also talked about earlier how acquiring and preserving relationships with mentors throughout Mm -hmm. your career was something that you did kind of by instinct. We got a great comment on our social media yesterday from someone who said, you need to build your own board of directors Mm -hmm. and have those be people that you're consulting with, bouncing ideas off of, following their lead, trusting them, things like that. I'd love to know in some sense how you've done that and how you identified those people. You talked about your partner, Lisa, things Mm -hmm. like that what the steps were in building your own board of directors and how you did that. Yeah. And then a second question is for putting yourself in the shoes of someone young coming up into the industry now, how did you go about and how do you go about recruiting people into this business you've built? What are you looking for, for young people coming into the industry? What do you expect them to know? And what's the path into a firm like yours? So pick your poison. Which one do you want to tackle first? Yeah, look, I think I'm happy to talk about either one, but I think this, this mentoring concept is, is important. Mm-hmm. So let's just talk yeah. about that for a few minutes. You know, growing up, even when I was in college and then from high school, part of the reason I went to college, which was not even on my radar to go to university. I'm a dairy farmer's really? daughter. Dairy farmer's daughters become dairy farmers. That was not Mm. on my radar at all. And I happened to show up at one of my many schools that we moved around to as a kid in the 11th grade. And I was fortunate with teachers who saw something that I, it's not that I I didn't think I was smart. I just never thought about a period. I go to school, I do work, you go home. And it turns out I was pretty smart. And he said to me, you know, you should think about going to college. And it's just because someone paid attention and gave me some forward advice that mm-hmm. I just didn't have at that time, but I'm smart enough to follow breadcrumbs. And so <laughs> I, I took that to college again. I had someone else in college who did the same thing. I got into Morgan Stanley and they were like, well, Deb, and gave me his advice. And, and I was lucky and I've been fortuitous throughout my career to have people like that. And I yeah. never thought about it until I've gotten old. And now it's like, well, how did you do that? And older, I realized, hey. older, older, <laughs> older, older, older. <laughs> And I've realized that relationships are a two-way street Mm -hmm, and you can't expect someone else to be responsible for it. 
if you want a relationship with something, you got to make the effort too. It's a two way street. Mm -hmm. And I think where um, people get this wrong and, and I've heard it before is uh, some people think that people don't want you to have, or they're too busy. They get too much going on. They won't make time for you. Mm -hmm. So you're too afraid or you don't want to put yourself out there because you don't think they'll just tell you to go away and they don't have time. And yes, I think that there are plenty of people that will do that, but there are also plenty of people that will, if you find someone that you have a connection with and think about this, liking you is mutual. I mean, how many people mm -hmm. do you like that they don't like you back? I mean, seriously, I just, you know, yeah. it just, every, yeah. if you like, if every you boy in it, middle school, I'm writing down their names. <laughs> forget the boys. Aside from that, when you get older. <laughs> forget the boys in middle school. Outside of that, in, in, you know, in, it tends to be liking tends to be mutual. Your friends, you, yes. they tend to yes. like you back, right? So mm -hmm. yes. I, I think if you find someone that you feel that you have a connection, invest in it. And, and you may not know why, you should just invest it because you can, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so over yeah. time, I look back and it's interesting. I sent one of my managing directors at Morgan Stanley a LinkedIn message. And I said to him, I said, you know, I just want to thank you because I didn't realize that how important your advice you gave to me mattered mm -hmm. until I'm giving it to others. And at the time mm -hmm. he had said to me, he pulled me in as a third year analyst. And he said to me, you know, Deb, he said, I will help you go wherever you want in your career. I'll help you anyway, but it's your career. You own it and you're responsible for it. So if you want something, you come and see me and I can help you, but it's on you. And that I advice has stuck with me over all these years. Here I am telling you and I tell college yes. students that it's your career, you own it. So the same mm -hmm. with mentoring. If you want to mentor, find people that you have a relationship with that will give you advice and invest in that relationship. And it will pay you back because over time they just get better and better. And at this point, I have so many of those kinds of people, but, and I'm willing to do things for them too. So when they reach out and they need something, I will free up. They call me, I answer the phone. They send me an email. They want me to look at a picture or a deck. I'll do it. Um, because yeah. it's the investment in the relationship. I still believe that if you treat people well, they'll yeah. treat you the same way in return. Yes. Okay. I, I so follow up question so to that, because yeah. so many of the mentors that you mentioned, you said he, mm -hmm. and we had a really interesting conversation in response to the article that came out in the wall street journal about Goldman Sachs's women problem. We yeah. have had some really honest and really surprising conversations with other women who are our peers in the industry at the time that we were in the business. We've had conversations kind of up, down, sideways, and across, but we've heard from so many women these surprising stories that their best managers were men and their worst managers were a female. Again, that's not everybody's experience. Yeah. And I don't think that was Kristen's in particular because she didn't have any. Yeah. I was going to say, I just tended to go into the groups that there was like no women. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> um, that was not Jen's experience. <laughs> but I, you know, I personally did have lots of female managers, some who were wonderful and some who weren't. And I'm curious to get your take on that now, especially as a female manager at the absolute top yeah. of the food chain, What's that like for you managing down? How do you see yourself in that role? And what was your experience like with female managers coming up through the industry? Yeah, it, you know, at Morgan Stanley, when I was there, there were not a lot of women, just mm -hmm. period, who were above me. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I found they were good, tough. They're very tough, but really were prepared to invest um, mm -hmm. if they thought you were good at your job. Mm. I, I will say you also <laughs> were in a group that had a reputation for having like the best culture. So. Yes, that is true too. I, I did. I've been very fortuitous with the relationships over time, yeah. but I haven't had a lot of female above me. My business partner, I worked under at Morgan Stanley and she's amazing. Um, she's mm -hmm. an awesome mentor. She's one of my closest friends. And I've been very fortunate because, you know, she's taught me much of what I know growing up in the industry. Yeah. But at the same time, I, there are women too that I think have been tough to work with. And here's the interesting part now I think about it. See, with, with guys, um, we can make the same comment. There's some great mentors and there's sure, some that are not. Sure, sure, sure. With women, the pool is so much more concentrated because there aren't mm -hmm. many. And yeah. so mm -hmm. it's easier for us to focus on, well, there was only two. One was nice and one wasn't. Whereas with guys, I was in a huge power group and all our clients were men. And mm -hmm. so it's hard to distill down 
because then even then you're like, well, there was one great and it wasn't because they were my, my world of two. Right? Yeah, that it, is it's that hard to two. distill it down. <laughs> it's hard. To, it's really hard to distill it yeah. down. But there were not a lot of female managers when I was growing up in the industry. And I'll go a step further. Even today, right, as I yeah. look across all of our clients and all the people mm-hmm. we deal with, there are not many women in the C-suite. Mm-hmm. at all yeah they're not yeah and so I think it's it may be a little more nuanced and I think it is probably very person specific mm-hmm. because at the same time I, I knew I had a great relationship with some women but other women may not have and I think yeah. I had great relationship with some guys and vice versa so mm-hmm. I think yeah. it may be a little more nuanced but the the point that still stands the same that if you're looking for a great female mentor the the pool for that is a lot smaller <laughs> it's, it's yeah not, And I, we've had these conversations too, just about how obviously a lot of these banks are pouring lots of money into trying to, you know, recruit and retain women. But I do think as people get more senior and again, especially when they decide to have kids, that's when it just gets really hard. And as you were saying, you know, you were in a family where your partner worked in finance also. So the hours and the demands of both of you means that there's less time to again, like do things at home. Yeah. And so I would actually love if you could just touch a little bit on like what it was like having a family and being and working in finance and ultimately climbing the ranks. And you said you had three kids at one point, all under five. So like they were, you know, I'm in that same boat where it's tough. So how did you manage that? And um, any words of wisdom for people who want to have a family and want to advance in their career? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I was probably one of the youngest to have a child at Morgan Stanley when I had mine. And I'll go to be honest, we were ready to have kids and that's just what Mm -hmm. I'm doing. So the world is just going to have to figure it out. Um, and, and, and I didn't apologize for it. I didn't ask permission for it. This is what I'm doing. And I said, this is what I'm doing. I'm having a child. And, and I, I do remember a couple of times working really late at night and saying, you know what guys, I really got to go home now because I'm very pregnant and I'm very tired, (laughs) but it's tough to get away with that in, in the new modern era. But back then the team was so supportive when I was a mindset. They were so supportive. I actually think most people will be surprised to hear that back then they were supportive and now it's tough to get away with. I actually think that's an amazing, yeah. I, I actually think that's caused cognitive dissonance for a lot of our listeners that back then it was supportive. Now you couldn't get away with it is really shocking for me to hear. Yeah. And I, I, the reason for that is I think that we are so focused on saying the right thing in the workplace and doing the right thing mm-hmm. that I think it comes at a price. Um, mm-hmm. and, and back, more. you know, back then I remember we moved some coverage things around because I didn't want to travel. I was pregnant and I was like, you know what? Thank you guys. You're great. Thank you. You guys all rock. You're all fabulous uh, for doing that for me. You know, there are some women that will agree with me and there are some women who say, well, you were treated differently. I'm like, mm. okay. But I look at it as, um, it's a support network is how yes. I frame it. And to get to your question, Kristen, you can have it all. So the, the, the misnomer that you, you have to be married and career and kids all have to be at separate times. I don't mm-hmm. agree with it all. You can have it all, but what it takes is some, it takes some compromise, but more importantly, it takes a support network. I have a great mm-hmm. partners. I've had great mentors, great people that I've worked with a great husband. I, I had a nanny for many years and I have great kids. They were all <laughs> raised. The mom's just trying to get through the day. And, and mm-hmm. I, I got to do these things. So you guys are just going to have to wait. And it is a balancing act from all of those things. It means you don't have much of your personal time and you get incredibly efficient. It's kind of the concept that if you want something done, ask the, the mother, working mother. With <laughs> ask the busiest children. person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it's, right. It, you become very efficient. And, yeah. and that's where a part of the, I don't second guess and I don't look back and, and yes. I'm very efficient with emails. It's because I don't have time. Right. I, you are I, like our spirit animal I on steroids. This <laughs> yes. is amazing. We uh, just everything you are saying, we can't yeah. identify with. More. And I, I want to say anyway. one more thing. It's it's really clear that you also really loved what you were doing and you I love do. your job. I yes. do. And I think that's so important too. I do. Like, yes. Yeah. I do. And and look, I find over time the blessings that I've had around great people. Yeah. And I think it's because I've been willing to accept the help from colleagues, the help from my friends. I, I don't look mm-hmm. at it as any affront. And if they're willing to cut me some slack, that's great. I'm happy to take yes. it. I'll go a step further. If you want to let me get in the elevator first and you want to open my door, <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. I'm all of that. I totally agree. 
and I'm not sure I was always that way. I think when I was younger, I liked to open my own car doors. But now that I'm older, I'm just like, you know what? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm just gracious. And yes. I don't read anything more into it than right. to which it was given. And, and this maybe isn't you're feeble. Character. You can't do it. I look down on you. I therefore am opening your car door. Hey, someone's doing me a favor. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And you know what? Yeah. I remember plenty of times being pregnant and on and on a bus going home from work, and some and so the guy will get up to let me have his seat, and I just say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I just say thank you, and and I'm appreciative for all the little things that people are willing to do, and they don't have to that are willing yeah. to do. And so I just don't read anything more. And that's a choice, by the way. It's right, yeah. we all get to choose how we receive yeah. this. We, it's our yes. choice. We can yes. either take it one way or we can take it yes. another. And as mm -hmm. always my preference to take it the way that is probably the, the best way. I, I'm happy to take it in the most positive way it was intended. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I think the other thing, you're not necessarily sitting there like glaring at someone if they're not getting up. It's like, yeah. okay, someone was nice. Cool. Versus yeah, like you people didn't get up for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There is, that is definitely the case. I, like I said, if they're not, I, I'm happy just to stand. I'm fine. I don't expect, here's the thing. I don't expect anyone to do anything for me. I yeah. don't. Yes. I don't. I, I paid mm -hmm. my own way. I got to where I am by myself. And I don't expect anyone. So when people do nice things for me, I'm like, wow, that's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's so darn nice. It's, it's so much so is about the expectation. Anyway, I love it. like everything you just said. Everything I wish you're I could saying, like I bottle it up is, and sell it. <laughs> is so important. And I want to go a step further. So you talked about not expecting anyone to do anything for you. We got into a very prolonged conversation yesterday with someone in our community who was saying, I'm a guy and it is so hard to get a job these days because there is a door held open for women. There is a door held open for minorities. There is a door held open for LGBTQ. Why is no one holding the door open for me? Mm -hmm. And it means that it's so much harder for me mm -hmm. to gain access to these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this guy's saying this stuff to you. And I was like, listen, actually, we're not that far apart ideologically because I bemoan how competitive everything is. The acceptance rate at my alma mater is converging on zero, right? <laughs> I couldn't get into, I couldn't even get into my kid's kindergarten these days if I applied, okay? Let alone get into Princeton, Morgan Stanley, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. It is so incredibly competitive. Yeah. But I'm curious in the context of how you approach everything with the, I don't expect anyone yeah. to do anything for me. How do you read into it then the current state of hiring practices, which are always in shift, which are always imperfect, which are always part of an ongoing process of trying to figure it out. Where do you see all that today? Yeah. And I appreciate that perspective that mm -hmm. he's offered and how he's looked at the world. And, and I will tell you for guidance for my own kids, because I have boys, it's, mm -hmm. you know what, don't spend a nanosecond thinking about it. And whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. It is what it is. So what are you going to do about yeah. it? You're going to sit here and mm -hmm. wallow in self-pity? If that's what you think, go find a way to make it work for you. So what yes. do you need to do? Yeah. What do yes. you need to do to make, to get that door? And if you can't get the door open, go somewhere else, do something else, right? It's on you to figure out how to narrative because the world owes you nothing. This world owes I you nothing. I love that. I would go a step further and say it should embolden people who feel like it's more competitive than ever for them specifically to say, I'm going to go take some risks. How do I make myself stand Correct. out even more? How do I make my interviewer Correct. laugh? How do I make Correct. them smile? How do I make them feel better about their interaction with well, yeah. me than anyone else? Yeah. And again, I think it's also having some self-reflection to say, well, why didn't I get the job? I mean, I, it was funny because I was reading some of these things and I was like, when I was a senior at Brown and I was interviewing for these jobs, I would make it to the super day every single time. And then I didn't get the job. Like I didn't get it. And I was like, cool. What do I now need to do to get the job? You know? And it was like, all right, I need to have an internship. I need to do like these things. So I'm like, now I need to go do that. You know? And it's like, you have to reflect on like, okay, well, what did I do wrong? And now let me make the changes so I can get there. And there usually is steps you can take. And in some cases, it also might be that maybe this isn't the path for you. So you do something tangential and I don't know, maybe you ultimately like start investing your money in real estate or whatever it is, and you like start your own fund and you create the thing that you want to like work in. I mean, like right. there's so many paths 
And Maybe you didn't to- get the job at the bulge bracket bank, but guess what? When we were applying for jobs, whatever it was, 20 years ago, okay, <laughs> there were like three jobs that you could apply for because there weren't that <laughs> many true. opportunities for undergrads, right? It was, well, you yeah. haven't been to business school. You haven't done your two years in investment yeah. banking, whatever. Right. Now, private equity is hiring kids who are learning how to tie their shoes, right? Yeah. There mm-hmm. are 10,000 other opportunities across this financial services spectrum that now are recruiting out of undergrad. And guess what? You might be able to land a better role because nobody knows yeah. about it and if you're well, actually willing to. Yeah. Yeah. the work and, and find it out and you might go get to work for deb smith like yeah, 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 yeah. i, I want to work for deb smith <laughs> seriously <laughs> well look yeah. on all these things it's it's just a case of again you know how you choose to perceive it and as i raise my own kids and my advice to just about anyone is if you don't get a job it is what it is get over it move on to the next one um they're probably doing you a favor the whole likability thing didn't work you probably weren't going to be happy there anyway right? right so move on and find something that works Time spent on stuff you can't change, it's a waste of time. It's time wasted. You can't, it's time wasted. If you can't change yeah. it, move on to the next thing. It's kind of a recipe to be much happier is not to stress yeah. the things you cannot change, right? They kind of are what they are. And if you don't like the world, you figure out how to navigate in the world that you have. If you want to go change it, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, figure out how to navigate. I don't have a whole lot of time for folks that want to sit around and say, it's someone else's fault or the obstacles were against me, or it was too hard. I don't want to hear it. I only want to hear what you can do and what can be done. That's it. Yeah. What can you do? I am like, what do you want to do? Beaming from ear to ear. <laughs> this is just absolute fire. Okay. So for young people who do want to come work for Deb Smith, who do want to break into, <laughs> yeah. I, whether it be real estate investment banking, whether it be commercial real estate investing, whether it be one of these operators that you talk about, what are the paths into the industry that you're seeing now? What do these kids need to know? What the is the terminology me, that yeah. they need to get familiar with? The door and... community wants to know the technical stuff. Like, <laughs> what are the actual terms? Like, loan right. to value. Are you talking yeah. about an OI? Like, what are the things that the, the talk that they should be able to speak? Yeah. To? And, um, and I think the, the answer to that depends on which firm you're applying to and who you're talking to. And mm. always keep in mind that coming out of undergrad, there's many ways to get to Rome. And, and folks can say, you know, the first job, it kind of sets you up for your career, maybe. Um, but for those that are, will, are willing to take no for an answer, we'll always find a way. It's kind of like the same as what college you go to. And successful people are going to be successful people. They just are. Time is of the essence. They show initiative. They will get it done. Regardless, sometimes it's a rocky road, but, th- but they will get there. So for folks that want to get into banking and they don't get in coming out of college, don't sweat it. Go into something related, right? Mm -hmm. And then keep your eyes open for opportunities that come up, right? And focus on what you're good at as your selling points. Um, And this will go a little out of left field. If you were coming to our firm, I actually don't really care uh, so much about how much knowledge you have about the industry coming in because information is free. We can go on to ChatGPT, can tell me anything I want to know about the real estate (laughs) industry. Right at a basic level and anything that I that has strategic value, you need to be doing this for 10 years before you'll figure all that out. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we're really hiring on and what I focus on, and it's probably the reason I got hired at Morgan Stanley, it's initiative. Right. How much can I process and how much can I learn? How much can I multitask and how much Mm -hmm. do I understand the value of showing initiative? Because right. coming into a firm, your job, and it would have been the same for you too. I want someone to make my life easier. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. Whatever you can do to run numbers, create books, track down clients, run due diligence rooms, you can do to make to, to have me make less decisions with respect to it, the more value you have. None of those things really require knowledge coming in. They require skills. And I think it's life traits to me. Of course, if you talk to my business partner, she'll give you a different perspective on this. <laughs> so, but mm-hmm. she's not what would on be knowledge. her perspective? Oh, she, she wants the like, technicals. Yeah, she but how do you, on the how do you How do you demonstrate initiative? This is something that we're always trying to suss oh. out. How do you demonstrate initiative or grit in an interview? When someone's like, tell me a story when you showed leadership and someone's like, wow, no. I've never thought of this question. It's so funny you should no. ask. When I played the trumpet when I was five and they've got this whole can yeah. story, I know that's not what you want to hear. So how do you do it? Yeah, I I actually never ask any of those questions either. Mm. Um, I think initiative comes out by asking how, what you do in your everyday life. What Um. do you do in your everyday life? 
what do you do? Tell me about where you've come from. Tell me about things that are important to you. Tell me about why you picked the school you did, why you picked the courses you did. Did you work during college? What kind of job do you do? You know, how did you get the job? It's questions like that. Because if you think about it, the more things that you're doing, particularly in mm-hmm. college, the better multitask you are. I don't need to ask yep. you if you're a great multitasker. But if you're working a job, playing a sport, doing college tours and holding up your grades, wow, you must be a pretty good multitasker, right? Uh-huh. So you can, there's a lot of ways to get to the same point by just having a conversation. And so at this point, you know, I run our consulting business. And so I've gotten pretty good at, at reading and breaking down people's character. And I look for very certain things when I'm talking to anyone that's coming in as a result, because mm-hmm. I do think I, I can teach a lot but I can't teach character. You just can't, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Yep. Now, of course, the, the banks are a little different because, and coming back to wh- where you guys started, they have so many resumes and they have so many yeah. things. Even for us, we're probably getting, I don't know, hundreds of resumes for everything mm-hmm. that we post. Right? You're about to start getting thousands. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for what we post. But, but for the bigger banks, you know, they have different requirements and things that they're looking at and to help them with their screening tools. I do think it's very individualized, I do. But for us, I just know that people will go the extra mile if they value the relationship. They will go the extra mile, they'll work so much harder, they'll do so much more if they wanted to do it for you. And they want it, and it's Mm -hmm. their character to, to deliver the best product. They can't have that extra space or they can't have that extra box out of line because that's not their DNA. And I don't Mm -hmm. find you get that out of a GPA necessarily or an ACT score. That can tell me how quickly you can reproduce information test conditions, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell me if you know how to synthesize it and give Mm. me practical experience as to what you're going to do with it. And and it's the second part that makes you successful in banking. And I think it's probably the number one reason why kids don't go, don't ACP and why they're encouraged to go to business school is because mm-hmm. you're going to business school to learn how to synthesize and to think strategically tactical about information. That's the reason yeah. why. Yeah, no, I love that. So I want to actually sort of switch a little bit. Obviously what's going on with commercial real estate is like a huge thing these days. So this is actually two-parter. So number one, I do not have the real estate background and I listen to podcasts like all the time. And a lot of times there are terms that people throw out there, which they have not defined because this is one of the things that we try to do on this podcast is to actually give people some of the big terms that they need to know or, yeah. you know, whatever, whether it's cap rate or the NOI, all those kind of fun things. So what are some of the real estate <laughs> specific valuation terms that people should know? Yeah, No, it just made me laugh because I remember when I did at my first real estate deal with Gable, I remember mm-hmm. I was saying to Lisa, I'm like, what's this NAV? <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's, like, yeah. it's a very specific real estate term, right? Which yeah. is net asset value, which is how yeah. uh, a lot of you measure, particularly the public resale of. So in real estate, again, there's going to be two buckets. So on the one yep. hand, we're down at the asset level, which has specific mm-hmm. metrics and how you look at and how you under and how you analyze real estate. And then you've got the manager level, which is where you're more likely to touch in banking. And, and mm-hmm. you touch down on some of this, but how much depends? Because if you think about it, let's just say you're at a big bank and you're looking at acquiring a take private for a REIT. They may have yeah. 2,000 properties. You really think you can go through and underwrite 2,000 properties? No, it's mm. you're looking at a lot, lot higher level. It's when mm. you start decreasing your deal size and you're getting into my world that our clients expect us to understand the real estate, right? And it's, it's part of a specialty for us now that separates mm-hmm. us that we know how to underwrite it. So keeping mm. that in mind, at, the, at an asset level, and it depends on which, which product that you're in. So let's just stick to what I call the four food groups which is yeah. office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. Mm-hmm. On those, you tend to look at cap rates, which stands for a capitalization rate, which is really the yield of your value. It's how things mm-hmm. are valued. It is akin, so is it- an EBITDA multiple, Got right? It. Okay. If you were thinking, oh, well, how do you value this property? If it yeah. was a company and a lot of people are more familiar, it's an EBITDA multiple. In real estate, it's not an EBITDA multiple. It tends to be an NAV, which functions off a cap rate. So your NAV, which is your net asset value, which is essentially the equity value of your assets. Mm -hmm. And then you have your capitalization rate, which is the yield on which your asset, which throws off your asset. And it is equal to your, essentially your cash flows over the property's value. And ironically, here's the interesting thing. So if you're looking at EBITDA multiples, the higher the Mm -hmm. multiple, the more it's, it's worth, right? 
Yeah. Real estate's the opposite. The lower the cap rate, the more it's worth because it means you've got a lower yield. So you're paying more for it. So the value is higher. So us just coming through COVID and we're, when you read in, in newspapers and you follow real estate alerts, it will say multifamily hasn't repriced enough because cap rates are still in the fours. That means like, wow, four is, that's a lot of money. It's expensive versus if you think about interest rates at 6%, then it's a, you, to acquire it, it's a dilutive deal, right? It means it's negative yeah. leverage. So mm -hmm. the higher the cap rate, it looks cheaper, sim very simplistically. So mm -hmm. if okay. it's, you know, a nine cap, you're, which is how you'd phrase it. If it's a nine cap, you're like, it could be like a C asset in Timbuktu, right? Because <laughs> it, it's, it's like, that looks cheap versus- if Oh, you and when you say, sorry, when you say C asset, can we uh, quickly go through yeah. the categorizations? Yeah, so you have A, B, uh, assets tend to be classed A, B, and C as our, as our markets. A is mm -hmm. super, super nice, new construction, really, really nice stuff. Mm. And then you go down into B, it's easy just to jump to your C. And C is like 60s, <laughs> 70s product. It's old. Yeah. It's not necessarily in great market. The Soviet block architecture <laughs> with the- yeah. uh... <laughs> Low ceiling. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and so there's your discrepancy. And so we tend to say, if it's a high cap rate, then like a nine, that just usually it's because it's a C property or a C market or, or something like that. And your mm -hmm. A's, which is uh, where you got super low cap rates, that means it's mm. expensively priced relative to that. And so cap rates now, a lot of people think that multifamily, the pricing hasn't gone down enough, which means a high cap rate mm. because coming out of COVID, it's still got more correction to make because it got so expensive over the last two, three years, which means it had a very low cap rate. So mm, for us, and, and Kristen, come back to where you had asked around core and categories before, things mm -hmm. were pricing at for core real estate in like a market like DC could be a three cap or a three and a mm. half cap, which is crazy if you think about where interest rates are today, the 10 years at a four two or a four three. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. think yeah. about that, what that means. And now yeah. you can see why there's no transaction activity. That's well, and that, I feel like that in, in Manhattan too. I mean, we are, Correct. we own a house in, or an apartment in Manhattan and it's like not only the co the cost of borrowing, but then also the HOA yeah. fees and you're like, okay, that's not, that's yeah. not good. Yeah. So then the next thing, so, you know, every, a lot of things are done on a DCF basis. So mm -hmm. if you were going to interview for a position out of college, you'd want to understand how DCFs work, mm -hmm. the difference between levered and unlevered returns for that, yeah. how mm -hmm. you would look at cap rates, how you would look at exits. They're the basic questions for your DCF. It's hard at an actual property level to know too much coming out of college. I mean, you could pick up some of it, I suppose, in a real estate class, but the things that drive your asset, if you think about it, there's only a handful of things. What the yeah. rents are that people pay, what the vacancy is mm -hmm. um, that you have on the property, where its location is, how much capex that needs to go into the properties, what your management yeah. fees to management and what your opex is. Right. Yeah. And so th there's not that many things. And you'd be amazed at slight changes in cap rate, how it changes the value of your properties or slight changes in vacancy from even from mm. like a 95% vacancy to a 93% vacancy. It's uh, sorry, uh, occupancy with a three to 5% vacancy. It's I was going to say, I hope these change. office buildings aren't 93% no, vacancy. <laughs> No, no, sorry. Ninety-three percent, ninety-three percent occupied, ninety-five percent occupied. Somewhere around that zip code is how a yeah, lot yeah, of folks yeah. underwrite your occupancy of real estate. And so then, you know, and on value add, how long do you need downtime for? You know, if you're going to rehab a, an apartment building, how do you do that? Do you kick all your people out? Do you do them one tenant at a time as they roll over? How long does it yeah. normally take you to do it? What are you doing? What's your return on the capital that you're putting into the property? All of these yeah. things go into it. Then you got to talk about, well, what kind of tenant are you getting? If it's mm -hmm. apartments, are they, are they 50,000 a year, 75,000 a year, a hundred thousand a year? What does that look like? What's the supply dynamics? Mm -hmm. And then your pricing comes down to alternative to cap rates. A lot of folks look at dollar per unit. So if you're going to buy an apartment building, what are you paying on a dollar per unit? A lot more common, I think probably 15 years ago than now, but still very much uses dollar per square foot. How much yeah. you're paying for a dollar square foot. And that is the common metric across industrial for office, as well as for retail. But the unit concept is very much alive in the multifamily space. 
And actually, since we're talking about commercial, like some of the issues with commercial real estate. So oh. I feel like I'd heard a lot about this whole idea of like wall of maturities that people yeah. were worried was going to signal yeah. almost like an Armageddon for the real estate yeah. market. Although it seems like that's maybe not happening just because a lot of lenders, I guess, are working to renegotiate loans. But I don't know. I mean, what is your view? And can you talk a little bit about what is actually going on in the commercial real estate market yeah. these days? I also think- caveating this, that this is March 27th when we're recording this episode. This may right. not air March 28th. So even if your advice or your thinking may have changed, this is just a snapshot of how you might approach yeah. Yeah. market dynamics and valuations. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of people, absolutely, Kristen, are talking about there's a lot of maturities coming up because a lot of debt is, you know, it could be three to five year debt mm-hmm. and it could have been fixed rate debt that's on properties. And part of where we are now is if loans are coming off, how do you refinance them? Let's just mm-hmm. take you, you bought an apartment building and you mm-hmm. pay for that with 65% debt when mm-hmm. money was practically free. Mm-hmm. Now I'm telling you, you've got to pay five, 6% of debt in order to refinance that. And then I come along and I tell you, oh, by the way, that's 65%. I'm not giving you that anymore. I only want Credit to conditions have, have tightened. Yeah, now it's yeah. 55%. Way more equity in the deal. Yep. Correct. So now what And valuations are down. Correct. So now all of a sudden that's you're underwater exactly. on the equity you had. Correct. Yeah. Now you're underwater on the equity. And so that's when they're talking about what's supposed to happen with the wall of maturities is that people are seeing, well, what happens? Do the banks foreclose? Do they work it out? What do they do? And as a general trend, we're seeing lenders are saying, just keep it the property, particularly if it's performing. Let's just figure out a solution. We'll kick the can down the road and we'll hope that (laughs) conditions improve and it comes back. Now, that's not universal. I've definitely heard uh, my fair share of war stories where folks have wanted to give the property back and the lender's like, what do you want me to do with it? It's like, yeah, no, yeah. you keep it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Like, you know, what's a lender going to do with the property, right? Particularly right. if it's not performing, what are they going to yeah. do with it? So yeah. I guess if we have this wall of maturities, which we all know debt matures, so we know it's coming. The real question is, is what happens as a result? And I think on the one hand, we're seeing lenders extend for, for sure. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, as long as the property is performing, because yeah. what goes into your matrix on your valuation, remember is on our cap rates, is the NOI. So if mm-hmm, your mm-hmm. NOI is still going up and still improving, then there's an argument maybe you can grow yourself out of it. Mm-hmm. I might be able, is my property may have gone down in value because of the capital structure, but maybe I'm holding because I've got improvements in NOI that offset it because they're the yeah. two things that have gone into the value of my property. So that's yeah. one thing. So if the fundamentals are good for the property, it's generating strong NOI. That's a different conversation. And I think there's definitely a lot of areas, both geographically and product wise, that that's mm-hmm. the story. So let's just yeah. take those out for a minute and focus on the ones that maybe they're not performing or they're a little weaker. Then I think yeah. the question is beyond extending or that they can take it back is what we're now also seeing is a growth in gap financing. And this mm-hmm. is what will end up applying to both buckets. But the gap financing, and it's the same thing with the GFC. We're coming out of the GFC where debt with the traditional banks went away and insurance yeah. companies went away. What happened? Well, the smart entrepreneurs in real estate come up with their yeah. own new forms of debt financing. Mm-hmm. And then they raise private equity funds around it to fill the gap at more expensive pricing. So now yeah. we're seeing preferred and MES are really stepping up to say, well, if the lender is not going to let you, they'll refi it at 55 maybe and the value has gone down, we will fill that gap. It'll be higher priced, but you right. need to fight another day. And, and so yeah. we're starting to see that product. It's probably been around for a little while now, but it's really starting to grow as a product to fill the gap. So the wall of maturities is we're just going to have to wait and see. Well, yeah, yeah, it's probably a big opportunity too, right? I mean, everyone keeps talking about everyone flooding to the private credit markets and things like that. I mean, in a world where, listen, rates are higher, but they're not high, right? That's right. Six percent, right? Like it's 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 nothing, right? On like a real my parents, it's not. Yeah, my parents, yeah. My parents, yeah, when so they bought you, their house in uh, 1980, their interest rate was like 16 or 17 percent. So yeah, like, you know, right. Which On is a historical was, basis, rates yeah. are not high. So yeah. the question is, and and listen, 
unless you think that equities are just going to continue going up every single day for the rest of our lives, which who knows, that's another story for another time. You know, mm-hmm. if you can lock in some of these yields in the, you well, know, high single, low double digit range on this stuff that has probably actually relatively low default rates, it's a home run yeah. and then you're just a distressed well, debt investor. It was, there was a couple of interesting things. I think it was like on the All In podcast, they were talking about the fact that a lot of these banks probably have those properties on their books, not at the actual current market values. That's so like right. if they were down. They've written them yeah, down. Yeah, it would be bad if they had to like basically take those properties and sell them. But also that like some of that land, it's almost like you can't even give it away, especially in certain oh, places. I, I think like San Francisco, it's <laughs> yeah. like, you, you, you can't, even if you want. That's, like, my, point the, that's my point with yeah. the, the land yeah. is, is yeah. like, what do, you, what do you want me to do with the downtown office right. building in San Francisco? Yeah. Right. What exactly. am I going to do with this abandoned Whole Foods? Like, yeah, there's nothing I can do with, do with this. Yeah. So, I mean, like, they'll just, they'll end up, we'll have to, some of this will play out. What should happen is that you would expect the markets to reprice what, even what risk adjusted returns are and what pricing for these assets should be. And whether it's on a cap rate basis, a dollar per square foot, a dollar per unit, you would expect an overall market correction. But the reality is, we said the same thing coming out of the GFC. That's what yeah. we expected. And here we are down at 3% cap rates again, <laughs> yeah. you know, coming out of COVID. So it, it's a great in theory, but I think what happens is, is there's so much supply, there's so much demand, the dynamics and capitalism at its finest in the real estate space, it keeps going up and down, up and down, yeah, up and down. Efficient. So yeah, I mean, the one thing we know for sure is the real estate markets, they always bounce back. They do. And whether it's reprice on this, this stays cheap, that stays expensive. We get new ways of doing things. We get more efficient at doing things. Information becomes even more efficient to distribute that I think it, it ends up rattling through. But do I think we'll never see a three cap rate again? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure I would have, I, I probably would have been quicker to say no way coming out of the GFC, but not yeah. anymore. The, unless the interest mm-hmm. rates stay high, then that, that'll obviously influence it. What yeah. do you think about this fever dream that occasionally gets written about in the press of converting mm-hmm. all of this underutilized yeah. commercial real estate into residential? Never yeah. going to happen. There is a world where you see it happening. What do you think? Well, um, I will let you two figure that out by asking you a very simple question. Do you know what the problem is with 80s office buildings? They don't have windows <laughs> <They're>... that open. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. And I feel Where like you I do remember- that? Yeah. <laughs> No, I know. Yep. You're going to retrofit the whole building? I mean, you yeah. remember. And I, where's I, the bathrooms? You have to have a bathroom and like, if you're going to like make well, all the units yeah. out of it, where prohibitively, the prohibitively expensive is where everyone kind yeah. of comes down on, um, on all of this. But you know, there's. A, However, a how, yeah. no, you're right. Jenna. However, it's, that's a general comment. And I think that's mm. on the, on the whole office conversion thing. I do think there is plenty of property that can be repurposed. It might be office to resi, but it could be something else. Maybe it's a mall to an industrial facility to convert to, you know, last mile logistics, right? Mm -hmm. Or turn it into a school or turn it into, you know, something along Mm. those lines. You don't have to keep an old mall an old mall, right? It can have more than one use. And whether there is something to that argument, because what we also have seen is the real estate sector has gone through a lot of change coming out of COVID, particularly in the industrials and logistics. And if you think about it, a lot more focus on getting products to consumers faster, right? That's mm-hmm. the, that's where we are. We, everything has to be done faster. It's the time that people are willing to cut, even communications and email. Everyone expects everything yesterday. And what the impact of that to last mile logistics translates into, you know, Dick's Sporting Goods have a section in their store that just services online orders, right? Mm -hmm. Or converting a part of a parking garage and using that and and to store uh, store product. That's why iOS, industrial outdoor storage, has taken off because the Mm. logistics around transportation, there's such Mm -hmm. higher expectations. And, you know, sitting in your house, you can probably get stuff from Amazon the same day or the next day. Where do you think they come from? All the time. But where does it come from? Have you ever asked where it comes from? How does no. it get to you that fast? I don't know. Magic. You can go any, any, that's right. You can pick any product and you yeah. can go and you're like, ask yourself where it comes from. But here's the thing. To get that product to you in that time, think of the logistics I, and the I, industrial yeah. that goes into doing that. Think about mm-hmm. that. And that's mm-hmm. where the opportunity still exists. And that's where, you yeah. know, another area similar is like data centers, which is now starting to pick up as well. Yes. Cold storage yes. is another mm-hmm. thing that is, is going. Self-storage, right? All of these things 
are, are working to adjust where the world is going. And so as a result, right. sure, there's some things that are becoming obsolete. Sure. But there's plenty of other things that are going to continue mm -hmm. to drive. And the smart entrepreneur who's following, because it's all about yeah. demographics, who's figuring out what's going on with demographics, the local market business aspect, they're the folks that are saying, well, there's a new idea here. There's a new idea. Yeah. Let's figure out how we can make money out of it. This is obviously outside of your personal realm of expertise, but you've seen the headlines about Adam Newman trying to buy WeWork back for $500 million. What do you think? What do you think? It's a joke? It's a scoop? What do you think? Hey, look, if, um, if, he, wants to, if he wants to take a run at it, I'm a born entrepreneur. It's knock yourself out. I, I've read my, my fair share. Uh, uh, the, it's a billion dollar loser. Is that what it is? The book that was really uh, bad on you, which was fabulous. Um, look, but it's, it's, it, this is a great industry where many fortunes mm -hmm. have been won and lost and yeah. he's just happened to be very, very public. So if uh, he wants to take another run at it and if folks are willing to give him the capital to do it, then they're all measured. Uh, you know what I'm going to say? Expe I expect nothing from anybody, but if you <laughs> want to go and do it, you knock yourself out. I love, love it. I love it. Stop wasting time worrying about whether it's a mistake and just go by WeWork. <laughs> hey, look, it's, I'm not going to do it. And, and it's, it's That's right. he, can, he can do him and I, I, I'm all good with it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Deb, this has been one of our favorite conversations thus far. You are a force with which to be reckoned. I think investment banking is a tough industry to get into and I recognize that. But I hope if anyone listens and has a takeaway from this, is that anybody can achieve anything in this world. It's just, mm -hmm. you don't need to apologize for it. You just get up and go for it. And let's just see what happens. You'd be surprised what you can do when you put your mind to it. Love it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, Deb. This was absolutely fantastic. And we are so grateful for you. Hopefully the first conversation of many. Oh, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs>